Good morning, everybody. Thank you to Emmett and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's exciting to be able to tell you about our work in OCT and geography and how that's going to apply uh, in the clinical practice and management of diabetic retinopathy as well as in clinical trials. These are my financial disclosures, and we've had the good fortune of working with the advanced development team at Carl Zeiss in, uh, even before the FDA approval of OCTA, uh, as well as uh, more recently. As you all know, diabetic retinopathy is a chronic disease, and several people have already mentioned that the early stages of these, some of these diseases, like diabetes, is not easily detectable, although we know that there's microscopic changes that are ongoing, such as parasite loss, ca uh, microscopic capillary nonperfusion, and microaneurysm formation. The accumulation of these findings over many years leads to the clinical presentation of the disease, <coughs> which we see as uh, retinal ischemia, neovascularization, and macular edema. Thankfully, the advent of OCT has allowed us to visualize some of these uh, microscopic changes, such as the development of macular edema. And our ability to quantify this uh, reliably and reproducibly in clinic has really facilitated uh, development of anti-VEGF protocols and paradigms for treatment, which are well adapted uh, throughout clinical practice. Simultaneously, it's been noted that anti-VEGF treatments also reverse some of the other aspects of diabetic retinopathy. But some of the detection of these uh, changes has been difficult. Notably, uh, the DRCR NET protocol S demonstrated that anti-VEGF treatments such as ranibizumab can uh, lead to f up to 47% of subjects uh, with, two or, with two steps or more of improvement in diabetic retinopathy severity score over two years, uh, leading in part to the FDA approval of uh, this drug for treatment of diabetic retinopathy itself. And we heard earlier about other drugs that are in the pipeline. So while this is very exciting and a paradigm shift in perhaps the treatment of diabetic retinopathy, the problem is that we don't really have a good way of assessing the clinical reversal of diabetic retinopathy in a clinically meaningful way. Certainly ETDRS uh, photographic grading is reasonable as a research tool, but as a clinical tool it's not particularly effective um, or possible. So therefore, what we need is some quantitative method, much like OCT quantifies uh, retinal edema, to help stage diabetic retinopathy, both for the early detection of the disease, as well as for pharmaco pharmacologic treatments, such as the one I just described. What I'll propose to you today is that OCT angiography is such a tool. Uh, certainly, validation needs to be performed, but OCT angiography is based on spectral domain OCT, which we're all familiar with. As mentioned earlier, when multiple OCT scans are done in the same plane, we can take advantage of the difference in the reflectivity of light from moving particles, such as red blood cells, compared to the static neurosensory tissue. And this allows us to then detect moving objects and essentially create a motion contrast map. Now, just like OCT, OCT angiography has micron level resolution and also depth resolution. So for the first time, we can non-invasively, without any dye injection, see individual capillaries, and we can see them in a depth-resolved fashion, which has not been possible with fluorescein angiography or any other imaging method, really, that's widely commercially available. The FDA approval of OCT angiography in 2015 has really led to its wide-scale adoption, and here you can see an illustrative OCT angiographic map of the retinal vasculature in a normal subject. This is an example of an OCT angiogram in a subject with diabetic retinopathy. In the top middle panel, you can see that the fluorescein angiogram clearly demonstrates microangiopathy. However, quantifying the area of ischemia in the subject is very difficult, and even though FA has been around for a long time, we still don't really quantify using fluorescein in any meaningful way in clinic. In contrast, the OCT angiogram in the lower left clearly defines areas where there's no capillaries, and the fact that this is a depth-resolved image allows us to quantify areas of non-perfusion, which our group and several others have done in a reliable fashion in this disease. But more importantly, what I'll argue for to you today is that we can quantify changes in the capillaries that are present, and these changes, both in density and morphology, can lead us to better detect the disease early on, as well as detect reversal of the disease process. As you can see here, qualitatively, it's very easy to tell the progression of disease when you look at the, a binarized image. In the top panel, you have the raw OCTA images, and in the bottom, you have binarized black and white images of the same and diabetic retinopathy increases in severity from left to right. 
As you can see, there's a significant capillary loss with worsening of diabetic retinopathy. We performed several studies, uh, most of which are now published, three of which are published, one in diabetic retinopathy, one in uveitis, and one in retinal vein occlusion, demonstrating that quantitative parameters of density and morphology actually correlate with various aspects of disease severity. I'll describe two of these studies to you briefly today. Here you can see that a, a surrogate marker of capillary density, which is just a rough measure of the surface area of the retina that's covered by a uh, vessel signal from the OCTA, correlates fairly well with the severity of diabetic retinopathy. So normal healthy subjects have the highest vessel density, and as the severity of diabetic retinopathy increases, the capillary density decreases. Uh, more importantly, this is statistically significant even at the earliest stages of diabetic retinopathy for evaluation of the superficial retinal layer, and the trend is statistically significant for all the layers that we've evaluated. Other measures of, not of capillary density, but of capillary morphology tend to correlate as well. So in this particular example, we're looking at a vessel diameter index, which represents the thickness of individual capillaries within the retina. And here you can see that there's a statistically significant correlation between vessel diameter size and the severity of diabetic retinopathy. We've also performed similar analyses in subjects with retinal vein occlusion just to demonstrate the uh, robustness of these kinds of metrics. And in subjects with retinal vein occlusion, which have many of the similar findings in retinal ischemia and macular ischemia, uh, they're typically classified as vein occlusions or central retinal vein occlusions, but the OCT angiographic parameters of capillary density tend to correlate with the severity of the overall clinical disease. And in both of these diseases, what's impressive is that the capillary density measures are only being performed in the central three by three millimeters of the macula, yet they tend to correlate with the clinical observations and the clinical staging of disease throughout the whole retina. Certainly, this will be useful for diabetic retinopathy if demonstrated in larger clinical trials, which we're ongoing right now. Certainly, and this will be useful both for the early detection as well as the reversal of diabetic retinopathy. And as the wider field of views continue to develop, uh, detection of neovascularization will also be an additional biomarker. Thank you very much.